Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Oh, uh, I'm, Ch I'm Charles Schaefer from the state of Minnesota's Small Business Assistance Office, part of the DEEDS uh, Office of Small Business and Innovation. And every month uh, on the second Tuesday of the month, we put on a small business call where we invite outside parties and other interested parties, individuals, uh, to come and listen to presentations about what we perceive as useful small business topics. Uh, and uh, our intent, as I said earlier, is to get good information out to the people who are listening, who are attending, but not necessarily uh, encyclopedic information. Uh, and uh, we're hopeful that today we could speak a little bit about uh, the realities of uh, the uh, marketplace for uh, medical insurance, health insurance, uh, as it applies to individuals and to small businesses and small businesses that are looking to provide for their uh, employees. Uh, just uh, uh, one uh, note here, uh, Pete Orth and uh, Sherry Alvarez, who are the presenters today, uh, are not members of the um, are not, not members of the uh, staff of DEED, are not state employees, and have promised that they're not going to try and sell you anything. So uh, that uh, with that caveat, I'm going to have them go ahead and start. Pete is himself a, a certified financial planner, certified financial planner, and manager at American Senior Benefits, which is a broker in a broker enrollment center for Minsure. That's a relationship that I'm going to ask him to explain what is a broker enrollment center, how does it work. And uh, I'm going to ask, ask him, for those of us who are old but not that old, uh, if he could explain a little bit about what the uh, history and the dynamic is of how we came up with Minsure uh, and, uh, you know, in the context of Obamacare and the like. And... Uh, how it works and what it does, and then how uh, people use it to buy insurance. Uh, so, Pete, please go ahead. I'm sure you okay, too. Great. All right, thank you, Charles. Um, so, yeah, our our firm is actually we're a broken enrollment center, but we're so much more than that. We're really a holistic planning company that takes Minsure into consideration, other health benefits uh, that you might be eligible for. Um, and then also retirement benefits and um, kind of strategizing on how you can structure yourself uh, from a even a tax perspective, because a lot of the miniature benefits that you get are based on tax credits, uh, especially on the individual level. So we take a, a person's entire situation under under advisory and we make a best recommendation from that, whether it's us helping with a, a particular plan through Minsure or through shop or through whatever the program is, or if it's a plan that's a, a public program or maybe your employee base is such that um, they should be going direct or they'd be getting more tax credits or something along those lines. So it's really an individual basis. And then we can also, the rest of our firm gives other services like the whole retirement planning. How can I retire? We have a certified um, exit planner on staff that it's a SEPA designation that helps people um, actually exit out of the business and have a plan that's that's uh, structured for that. Uh, we do Medicare analysis, we do income ret retirement income planning, and then a whole plethora of other types of insurance plans. We have over 200 insurance companies that we do business with. Um, the definition of a broker is very vague. Uh, there's no real standardized criteria. You could have two or three companies that you do business with and call yourself a broker. Um, we truly shop the marketplace for our, on, on behalf of our clients. So we're more, to your point, Charles, we're not in sales, we're in consulting business um, on the insurance and the financial planning side. So um, American Senior Benefits also works hand in hand with Corestone Wealth Management, which is a registered investment advisory firm that helps people with uh, the whole retirement on a fiduciary basis. So. Anyway, that's a quick quick flyover. I don't want to, you know, make everybody on so fast on that all. But um, so a little bit of history, uh, Sherry, if you want to maybe talk a little bit about some of the history behind Venture and um, then go into, you know, maybe shop and 
some of those other things. Yeah, so I mean, everybody knows about Obamacare or, you know, the Affordable Care Act. And so they saw it as a way to try to make insurance affordable. Um, there was a federal exchange, but Minnesota itself decided to take and go off exchange. And our exchange product is Minture. And so uh, from what I can remember, uh, Minture came out and I believe it was 2013 or 2014. You know, it's been through a lot of changes and stuff and you know small business owners can use it for shop i know that um, there's something called icra which is individual um what does that say i'm forgetting keep you know it's where the employer gives their um employees you know rather than having a plan through shop or having you know going directly to an insurance company to offer plans so they'll, they'll tell their employees here we'll give you some money every month to go and shop for a plan on minsure and then they just prove that they've paid for the plan and they get reimbursed by the employer. So there's a couple of different ways for small businesses to take advantage of Minsure. And so, I mean, the history has just been ebbing and flowing and such. So I'm not sure how much more. I mean, there's four main um, insurance companies. So Minsure itself isn't the plan. I think a lot of people think about it that way. It's, a, it's just a shopping marketplace where companies can go and look for plans or individuals can with that ICRA. And so that's Health Partners, UCARE, Medica, and Met, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, pardon me. Yeah. So, and I know that with Blue Cross Blue Shield, they tend to be one of the bigger shop um, policies. So I've seen in my experience, a lot of people will go with policies through Blue Cross Blue Shield, but really any one of them, just depending on the size of the group and what the employers and employees are looking to spend they can definitely find something that can fit their needs either through shop or through something such as an ICRA. So maybe we open it up for questions and- Well, let, you know, let, me, let me begin with a question to drive some further uh, comments by the two of you. Uh, let's say that I have a small machine shop that employs 20 people. And uh, the, uh, the, I say, I ought to be able to get some health insurance for these people. And uh, other than going to a as, a, as a business, going to a major uh, insurance carrier, what can I do utilizing Minsure and the uh, brokers that you guys know? Right, so that's where that piece shop comes into play. So it's a tool that a broker can use to essentially shop, you know, different options for that shop, you know, that employer to see what options. So, I mean, really a lot of it is, you know, what are they willing to spend? What are they, the employees willing to spend? You know, what do they want to set the deductible and or the maximum out of pocket and other benefits? So the shop tool is nice because you can kind of put stuff in there and you can, um, what I'm looking for. you can really get it specific to your needs and really just kind of play around in there and find something. So so is it the employer or the employee who utilizes that to tool? Or can either one use it, use it at the same time? Right, it would be, you know, from my experience, either one. So it's the employer, I think, that goes in there and actually kind of, what they do is that it's really the employer that goes out there to kind of get the idea of the plan that they want. But then it's the employees that go in there to actually shop for their plan options and use it as the enrollment tool to get onto the plan. And is is the option a matter of how much you have to spend? You know, I had that I had to look into because I know that shop um, it does change from year to year. So I mean, it's definitely something I can get back to you guys on. Okay. I have a right, question. Mark. Oh, go ahead. Sure. Um, I'm in West Central Minnesota, and when I go on the Minsure website, uh, my clients or myself, we cannot get to the Mayo Clinic. Is there any workaround to that, or is it just discrimination by location? If you're in this area, these are your choices, and that's it. Unfortunately, you know, with Minsure, typically it's based on the region. So you have to be in southern Minnesota in order to access the, the Mayo healthcare system. You know, you, I hope at some point that will change, but that's just the way it works with Mensure. 
So do you think there's anything in the legislator to change that? Because it's really um, not fair. I mean, I mean, like other people can go if you're on Minnesota care or medical assistance, you can pretty much go any place you want. But if you're on the exchange, you are stuck. Right. And I don't know if that's legislation that drives that or if it's more the insurance companies saying, hey, we have these plans we're offering in these counties and only to these people that are in that area. Because really, when you go down to like Goodhue or Olmstead County, Mayo really is the only provider down there. There's not the saturation of providers like you have here in the cities, you know, with Line of Health or like M Health Fairview. And I think that's kind of also a way to kind of safeguard Mayo from having a too many people trying to access those policies. If they want to keep that specific to the region of the people, that that's really the only provider they can go to. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Sherry. Mark Simmer here with the Small Business Office. Let me read you a couple of questions. We'll start with the first one. Can a small business obtain group insurance with three employees, but two married to each other? What are the options for small companies like that? So with that, yeah, I typically have worked with groups bigger than three. And so there are rules to, you know, how that works with such a small business. And again, that's something we can go ahead and look into and get back to you guys. Part, so part of that, yeah. the answer to that question is going to be more individualized because when it's a real small group like that, sometimes you have the owner with a certain amount of income and one or two other employees. And sometimes it makes sense for them to go on the exchange in, individually and not create a group plan. And the reason is, is mature subsidies or their tax benefits, their their qualified tax benefits are are based on income. So if your household of two and or three, maybe they have a, a child and they're making $70,000, they might get a $300, $400 tax credit right from the state where they wouldn't be getting that through a small group plan. So a lot of those plans we don't see put together a small group like that just because of the, the income dynamic. And that's more of an individual, you know, recommendation that we make. Gotcha. That makes sense. Next question is, is this option available for Minnesota employers that have employees who live in another state? Yeah. <laughs> thinking, thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking about that. I would say yes, because the company is Minnesota based, but I feel like that would be kind of hard because if you have somebody who lives in a yeah, yeah, the network, it wouldn't work because historically a lot of the plans offered through Venture don't have a good network or really a network at all outside of the state. So I would think in that case, the employer would go back to something kind of like that IPRA I was talking about where they would yep. offer the, the employee money to go shop on their own either state exchange or the federal exchange to get coverage. That also makes makes a lot of sense. I, I threw a link in for uh, for ICRA also. Uh, next question is, uh, how do businesses shop Minsure functionality? Is there a website or portal? Do businesses need to go through a consultant or broker? They get to, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm just reading the question. Yeah. <laughs> so the answer is no, you don't need to use a broker, but there's really no value or benefit to not. You don't get a better rate. It's not like you're cutting out the middleman or anything like that. You're gonna get the exact same product with the exact same price if you go straight through Minsure or shop the plan out and do all the work yourself. So our job is as, as consultants, we make a little bit of money on each enrollment that we do or each member that we have. Um, and that's what helps keep our lights on and the you know screen and the camera that I Certainly. can't control half the time, you know, rolling. So um, so yeah, there's there's not a benefit or an extra value for people to not use a broker, but there's all there's additional benefits. So if you think about it. If you buy a plan direct through Blue Cross, Blue Cross is never going to tell you that their plan is not as competitive anymore, right? They're going to base you call Blue Cross and they're going to say, "Yeah, we're 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 great." Um, and we would analyze that against all the competitors and say, based on your circumstance, 
they may or may not make sense for you anymore. So, yeah, certainly understandable. All right, I'm going to skip the next question because we, it was dealing with uh, Mike's previous question about uh, two employees who are married to each other, and I believe he answered that in very much detail. Uh, the next question is, can you talk a little bit about Minnesota employers that choose ICRA for their employees and have employees that live both in Minnesota and North Dakota and how that all works, different benefits, premiums? So I guess I kind of go back to, again to that uh, you know previous question where uh, someone was asking about if someone in another state would be able to you know get onto a plan you know ICRA is it's not really state driven it'd be more uh, you know dependent on you know how the employer wants to set it you know what i run into is like they say okay i'll give this much for like the employee right and then this much for the family and so it's not going to matter which state you live in because you're just going to take that money and shop either your state exchange like we have venture or you're going to shop the federal exchange and that is what i believe north dakota actually uses mm -hmm. so they go what you do is they go out they shop for the plan and then they furnish proof to the employer each month to get that reimbursed it's not like just something that's automatic because you can you know as much as i don't like to say this you can really disenroll from a mensure or a healthcare.gov plan at any time so you still got to furnish proof from month to month that you're still paying that premium yeah okay uh, this would be, I would think, a really common question. What about if you're the only employee in your business? Yeah, and when, in that case, then if you're like the sole proprietor, you can't write a, a group plan for just yourself, right? You and a spouse, yeah. you put your spouse on payroll. Yeah, yeah, but you'd have to have them. Yeah. Are we recording this? Yes. We are. Yes, we are. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Mark. <laughs> sure. What about if we change a question to what if uh, I'm the only employee in my business, meaning that I pay myself a salary, reasonable salary, do the withholding, so I am an employee of my business? Same answer? Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, you still can't write yourself a, a policy. Okay. At least not okay. through the business. Gotcha. Uh, moving on, the next question. Uh, to Charles Schaefer's question on the small machine shop, the employers can have each employee get their own insurance through the exchange, and then the employer can provide reimbursement through a, uh, is it a QSERA arrangement? So it's not right. really a question, it's information, gotcha. No, I think it's more of a statement, right? Because the QSERA yeah. is, is very similar to the, the ICRA, they're just different. I feel like the QSERA is more for people, like larger groups, Versus the, the it are under 50 people. Okay. And, uh, and a question uh, for me directly, has Kusera been around a long time? Has ICRA been around for a long time? No, they've only been around probably three or four years. It was a, a way to try to find around, you know, because you're under, was it 50 employees, right? And you offer insurance. The employer has to pick up 50%. And so, and not only that, but when you're talking about a group plan, when I click on it, it shows up as a okay. dump receipt from the landfill. Just a just a quick note to people: if you could put yourself on mute, so there you go. Numbers, numbers don't match up. One was like one eleven, one hundred. All right, Mark, you're on mute. Yeah, I know. Someone just put me on mute. If everyone else could just please mute themselves while uh, while we're at answering the questions. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead, Sherry. Yeah, so I was going to say, so at any um, plan under 50, em, you know, employees, what happens is the premium or the, the value of the plan goes up with age as well. So if you've got somebody who's 60 or 3 or 64, that's quite a bit of money for the employer to be splitting 50-50. And so that's where these plans, you know, the Tissera and the ICRA were coming out were as another alternative to like, well, you know, we can't afford to offer you insurance, but we can afford to give you, you know, a $300, $400 stipend per month to go out and shop, mensure the federal exchange, get your own policy. And to okay. that point, if I could just add to that, um, a lot of times when people are over 65, you're going to qualify for Medicare, and it might make more sense to put that person on Medicare, have them buy their own plan on the private marketplace, um, and enroll in that instead of having to deal with a, a population that's giving you skewered numbers from a premium standpoint, you know, it, that would be a, a better option almost than, than trying to, you know, let's say you have a, an executive that's 70 
and three of his friends that he hired on as CFO, CEO, CEO, and then you have a whole bunch of other staff that are that have been with the business forever. Um, that it might make more sense to peel those people off and then reshop the group and um, and drop that cost down. That on top of that, all the group plans are going to have a, a problem this year dealing with prescription drug and it being creditable coverage because the government now in 2025, if you're over 65 or if you're eligible for Medicare, if you're under age 65 and you're disabled for two years, you're eligible for Medicare. And then you have to have a prescription drug plan that's credible. And if it's not credible, you're gonna have a penalty once you do find a drug plan later on down the road. And that's 1% per month, as long as you didn't have credible coverage. So. Um, every single employer on this group, on this call, if you have a group plan now or you have members that are over 65, we really should just um, get you off of that. Get, get all your members that are 65 or over off on, on a Medicare. It's going to be better coverage. And we talked late before about Mayo Clinic, how all these plans exclude, you know, and, and um, I don't remember what the term you, you used, but I didn't mind it. Um, about like a, a area that you live and not being available, gosh, you can buy um, a Medigap policy that goes anywhere, anywhere that Medicare goes, which is fantastic. So okay. a way low, lower cost than what you're going to pay on an insure plan. Excellent. I'm going to not skip the next question. I'm going to jump down. We had someone else throw in the, uh, in the comments, uh, plan varies by county. I'm an independent insurance broker for Medicare plans. So yes, there are, your point is, is well taken, uh, Pete and Sherry. There's, there's a lot of things that, uh, that people need to be aware of. There's lots of different plans. Um, and I'll just put a, a personal uh, mention here. This is why probably employers and probably most of us need to maybe speak to a broker. You don't have to purchase through them, but here are, here are the notes. Here are the things that when you're shopping, you, need to know about whether you you take it from one one company or another that's right. all right so we'll go yeah we'll go to the next question uh can you speak to employee eligibility when it comes to shopping through minsure is there an enrollment period uh, my concern would be that you offer an employee reimbursement for their health insurance costs as part of their benefits package but they aren't able to purchase a uh, a plan through minsure So typically if people, you know, with the group plans, they have, they do have like an open enrollment period where they have a limited time where they can enroll in a policy. Now as to mention itself, so if they're offering something like the KSRA or the ICRA, you know, the open enrollment for Minsure does run from November 1st through December 15th for January 1st effective date. And then December 16th through January 15th for a February 1st effective date. So if they don't enroll in a plan within those timeframes, then they are outside of any qualifying life event other than, you know, if there's like a birth, adoption, marriage, other kind of, like I said, qualifying life events they have to have in order to enroll into a, a plan outside of those open enrollment periods with Minsure. Okay, good answer. Uh, what is the minimum number of employees employees consultants would be willing to look at? Two, five, 10, 20, 30? We don't have company minimums. Okay. As part of our core values, we don't believe in, uh, we believe in serving the clients first and uh, therefore we don't, we don't do minimums. Okay. Now we're gonna flip that question to go to a very detailed question. We have 65 employees but only six use our Medica plan with a 50% employer payment. The rest of the employees uh, go on the exchange and get coverage. How can we determine if we are better off doing ICRA or offering uh, Medica at around 20K per year cost to the business? We would sit down and analyze that. Yeah. Right? Like we could, yeah. we could see if okay. we can. That's not just something we could throw out there right yeah. now because that's something that we'd have a needs analysis because, you know, um, if they're paying 50 percent, yeah, if you'd almost have to see what the employer really is willing. If they're paying 20,000 right now is for six people, I mean, 
yeah, we'd have to take a deeper dive and have a conversation with, with that employer to figure out what exactly it is they're hoping to get out of it. Yeah. yeah. And I, 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 I think that's an, an excellent answer because you really need to understand what you are shopping for. It's mm-hmm. like Pete, with your example of, if you go to any insurance company, yeah, they're, they're going to tout their, their product, which that is what they're supposed to do. But to have a independent or another set of eyes or two sets of eyes looking at it would be really useful for, for a business owner. Mm-hmm. All right, let's go down. Can Ooh, I slip see. one question in here, Mark? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it goes back to some of the stuff that Sherry was talking about there. If you have an employee who uh, goes and buys the plan, buys a plan on the individual marketplace, and they are a low-income person. Am I correct that they get a government subsidy to help them pay for that? They might. Yes, they might, depending and, on their income. And does the subsidy come as a tax credit or an actual payment? Mm-hmm. No, it comes as a tax credit. Okay. Uh, it, it depends. Yeah. So it could be a, a really high tax credit, or it could be a public program like Minnesota Care or Medical Assistance based on the number of fan, of people in their household and their overall income for that household. Okay, thank you. And we would guide yeah. that, we would help help guide that. And it, it also depends on what where the money's coming from and what type of assets, you know, what type, I'm sorry, what type of income. So a lot of people have what I call that phantom income out there where they might have a, a mutual fund portfolio or brokerage portfolio that's kicking out dividends and that's gonna count against their tax credits and count against their their uh, program. There's some ways on the that we can help guide that and and change some of those things to to work towards their to their advantage. But I do okay. just I do just want to say on that if you get that advanced premium tax credit, you have to be very very careful that you don't go over the limit that you reported for that credit because you could end up paying that credit all back and it could be yep. thousands and thousands of dollars, which you know, defeats the whole purpose. That's right. They audit your records in two years based on what your actual income ended up being. Because you could tell them that you make, you know, nothing. And they would just say, okay, and then they make you prove it eventually. But they're going to come back and audit those records in two years and then give you, uh, I affectionately call it a chargeback. Well, it it shows up on your individual tax return. So you get that piece of paper and it shows you the advanced earned premium tax credit. And as soon as I file that tax return, it's right on the 1040 what you have to pay back. That's right. Right. And, you know, they don't just because they qualify for the tax credit, too, I just want to point out. I've had people in the past, let's say they qualified for $300, they might say, well, you know, I'm pretty close to, you know, whatever. Let's use 200, right? So that they know that they can shore it up at tax time. That way they, they're kind of yeah. giving themselves a buffer so that they're not having to pay anything back, if not their own money. Yeah, you don't have to take the full credit. Yeah. Okay, All right. thanks All right. Candace. Uh, let's see, uh, Nolan put in some really good information about the uh, link for uh, Qsera uh, that defines is your small business eligible uh, to use Qsera. Um, let's see. So we're going to the next question. I know at one point there was an idea about small businesses being able to buy into MinCare. Is that possible? Into, I'm sorry, I missed that last part, Mark. Uh, MinCare, being able to buy into MinCare. Is that possible? Like Minnesota Care? Uh, I guess so. Um, if uh, No, because that's a state program, so that's not something they can buy into. It's a spend out. So yeah. not a spend out, but a, a income level. So the you don't get to pick your public program. You, yeah. you just state your income and then they put you on a, on whatever you qualify for. I think gotcha. is are we maybe not answering the question? Oh, I, I I think you are. I mean, if if the person who submitted it wants to kind of uh clarify, please feel free to do that. Uh we'll go on to the next one. Person writes, did I understand correctly that someone in the northern Minnesota region chooses ICRA for their employees and then the employees go out to the market to buy their own plan, either completely on their own or through a broker? The employees are not eligible to access the Mayo Clinic for care? Or maybe I misunderstood that part. Can you maybe give a little more information on that? 
No, that's correct. So if they're not residing in a, a county or an area where Mayo really is a prevalent or primary um, healthcare system, you wouldn't be able to come, you know, down from the Iron Range and go to Mayo. Would they, if they got a referral? Do they do some some sometimes, companies have. Yeah, sometimes I have kind of like a continuity of care. If it's like really like yeah. you know like you really need some kind of specialized care down at Mayo, but I haven't run into it personally. It's a it's a fight, I yeah. guess. I yeah. I was reluctant to bring it up because. It's really an insurance company's not a it's not a minsure regulation. It's an insurance company's procedure because they build networks based on um, based on their plan and how and who they want to pay for and that kind of stuff. Um, we have had, I think, like there was a case in the office where we ended up getting a client approved, and we had to go through like it was a ton of steps. So. Um, it's possible, but if you're a Jim Carrey fan, there's a chance. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's not a good gotcha. chance. But why All do right. you why do you think they allow medical assistance, Minnesota Care, to have access all through Minnesota, and then you go one step up where you have to pay on the exchange, and you're stuck? And I'm sure these companies get paid; these insurance companies get paid through tax dollars from the state of Minnesota. But they don't allow us to have health care like the bottom two tiers. Yeah, I don't I can't answer. I mean, I have just speculation answers for that. I don't mm -hmm. have concrete anything. Um, I do know that those public plans are funded by the state and they're well funded, it seems, because of just evidence of their benefits and their network. So that's more something that you should you could hit up your legislator and you know. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we have a question here, which Pete and Sherry, I, I know you can't answer. I think I can answer this one. What if you're a sole proprietor, but hire independent contractors, not employees? Um, if they are independent contractors, you do not need to provide health health coverage for them or health care. Uh, Mary Robinson, thank you, joined in to uh, add some more information about uh, ICRA. And Kusera has dropped in a couple of links here. Mary's with uh, Mincher directly. Um, we've got a question from Brianna. I was told employees 65 years old and plus can't buy a plan on the marketplace. So then they are forced to go on Medicare. Is that true? Um, yeah, that's, that's true. You're ineligible once you're over 65. The real answer to that, though, is why would you mm -hmm. want to? um they're horrible <laughs> when you hit over 65 even if you could you go to 64 years old the plan's going to cost you 1400 1500 dollars a month and it's going to unless you get massive tax breaks and and then you have a really limited network and then you have a deductible to hit like i would say you get to in that case right like it, when you look at the numbers it really doesn't make any sense to not go on medicare once you're 65 in, in Minnesota. Yeah, because okay. I know a lot of the people I helped them not, you know, while they were transitioning between like venture and Medicare, how relieved they were to go yeah. from paying $1,200 a month down to, you know, let's say even on the high end, $300. I mean, right. That's like $800 savings. Why would why would they want to go through venture? So the, and really the cases where we've seen where we had people stay on their group plan, and we're not talking about you know our, our our conversation today but it may be more like the the large employers that are subsidizing more than 50 percent of the premium sometimes that makes sense for people to stay on and not go on medicare but again you got the part d pro problem that's coming up in 2025 where their drug plan would have to have a max out of pocket of two thousand dollars in order for it to be credible and we're not we're not sure that that's going to happen with a lot of the plans so, Assuming okay. that these people on the call are, are small employers, um, you're gonna you're gonna want to show your employees Medicare if they're on 65 because it's it's just better. Okay, uh, Lynn, our other uh, broker that uh, um, added a, a question here, also added in the cap is at 200 this year for meds. I would assume that's 200 dollars. 
2000. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. Uh, question here from Nolan. Is Minture the only option for small businesses based in Minnesota to seek health insurance plans? So Minture, no, they could go always go directly to the okay. insurance companies. There's a lot of um, employee or employers that will go and do kind of like a bid out to the, like I said earlier, the four main carriers and see who comes back with a better bid. Yeah, it's really actuarially similar though, right? Like they're they're not using different group numbers. It's all actuarially seems to be the equivalent is what our math is showing. So it doesn't seem to make it like it's better, you know, like it's better. No, I think it's just with Minsure using the shop tool. Yeah, otherwise, you know, um, a business going out, it's broker driven really for some of those different tools that you use outside of Minsure. Right, right. Okay. And then you want to talk about other group benefits like long-term disability and life insurance and all those types of other plans that we would just write on the outside of, of the exchange. Okay. Uh, David has a question here. What are the current Minnesota state guidelines for what businesses are required to provide some kind of health insurance option? I don't think there's any thing that states an employer has to offer coverage. It's just a matter of if they're going to offer coverage, they have to offer it to, you know, a certain amount of their employees. I guess that's something you have to look into. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have to offer it. Yeah, that rule's changed over the years, so I'm not yeah. 100%. Yeah, that's that question kind of comes up in the uh, in the course of, of what we do in our office. Um, the way I usually explain it is it's it's certainly a benefit that employers see that they can offer their employees. But am I correct, Charles? There is no there's no statutory requirement to provide health care coverage. You are correct. There, there is none. The re statutory requirement comes with what's in the coverage. There are some things like mental health benefits and so on that you can't leave out, but you're not required to offer anybody anything. Okay. Uh, we have a question here. We have four locations under one corporation. The number of full-time equivalent employees changes monthly. We hire a lot of teenagers and very few of our employees want to be on a company plan because we can't afford family plans. Will families lose their current plans if we offer a health insurance plan? Mm, that's a good question. The answer is maybe. Yeah, so I would... Minsure is your tax credits through Minsure. If I'm an individual and I'm going through the state, if my employer offers plans, then I I won't get tax credits unless the plan is more than what is a nine point. 85% of your adjusted gross income, something along those lines that you can, Charles knows this answer better than I do, I think. Uh, but it, it's basically, um, if your your plan's deemed unaffordable, if it's over nine point some percent of your adjusted gross income as a family, then you can go on the exchange and get tax credits. So it, you effectively could harm your employee by offering a plan, if they're getting heavier tax credits on the open market, if that makes sense. You are, you are correct there, but the 9.8, yeah. Okay, 9.85, okay. Okay, uh, Lynn offers some more information too. So uh, in Minnesota businesses with 50 or more full-time equivalent employees are generally required to provide health insurance coverage yeah. options under the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, this is known as the employer mandate. Additionally, small businesses with fewer than 50 employees are not required to offer health insurance, but they may uh, qualify for tax credits if they do. So the those questions aren't yes or no. You you have to or you don't. There's, as Pete and Sherry are explaining, there are a lot of other things that are that are balanced in that uh, one, one affects another. Uh, I have another question. Yep. Another question, how reasonable would it be for multiple small businesses to band together to make an association health plan, an AHP? 
So I'm not as familiar with those. It's kind of like, you know, if a bunch of hair salons decide they want to get together mm-hmm. so that enough em- employees to offer some kind of plan. I mean, I guess if they could get enough employees together for 50 or more, I would find that more beneficial than a small group plan. There's a... If it's if they're contractors, like it's a association, but everybody's in really independent. I think mm-hmm. there's an argument to be made that there's a slippery slope that we're walking on because you're from an IRS perspective, you're creating an employer group, right? With a bunch of 1099 people anyway okay the the way the multiple layers of laws that are written in this country i'll just say i would stay away from it okay uh we did have someone throw yeah yeah i think so we had someone throw in a um a link to the uh, minnesota department of commerce they're uh they cover all the the insurance industries in minnesota um and they're talking about association health plans so i I'm I'm uneducated about that. I would I would check out that link from uh, the Minnesota Department of Commerce, and then there's another link in here for some information uh, earlier about the uh, the MinCare. I'll go on to the next question. If we offer health insurance stipend to our employees, do we have to offer the same amount to all full time employees, whether they have insurance or not? And are we allowed to have employee prove they have insurance? Yeah, I'm thinking about that. So, I mean, mm-hmm. um, with that, so they're saying that would they be able to offer different options to full-time employees? Um, and then if, I guess it's kind of like a, there might need to be some clarification on the that. HRA plan, sure. so they're yeah. the reimbursement account. Yeah, that or like the IFRA type stuff. You know, like can they offer different um, levels of like IPRA. I think that I kind of saw that question before, and I think maybe it was geared more towards that. Where yeah. yes, they offer different amounts, not necessarily to you know full timers, but like you know part timers. So, and you know a lot of them, from what I've seen or read about, it's like okay, again, it's like okay, if it's employee only, we'll get this much. If it's employee plus spouse or family, da da da. It's a different amount based on full time or part time. And if an ICRA is offered, they do have to prove that they are paying that premium every month in order for them to get reimbursed. Okay. I think that's a that's a good answer. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Brianna put in the chat employer benefits slash union agreements that have generous employer contributions and VIBA contributions. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, what the the comment is geared towards, uh, but can anyone answer what VIBA is? I I personally don't know what VIBA is. Yeah, VIBA is um, it's a four hundred three B type of retirement, or I'm sorry, um, health deferral plan where they can do different types of deferral based on uh, to use for health benefits, healthcare benefits. Um, but I don't know the answer to to the question, to be honest. Okay. Um, I'd be look, I'd be happy to look it up. Sure. We have a question here from Sarah. She might have missed it. Do businesses, small businesses, have to provide insurance options? I think if you look in the chat, the answer is no. That there are some federal requirements. Um, Mary's adding in an additional small business resource. Is the uh, Minnesota Department of Commerce again? There's a link to their industries and small business information um <laughs> yeah yes lynn i do not know how to pronounce your your last name shinyi there we go uh so thanks for uh for helping out with that is there a straightforward another question sorry is there a straightforward average salary amount that you are aware of where it makes more sense for employees to seek insurance individually yeah, so it's based on household income. So you can actually go to Mincher's website and type in, you know, it's based on your age, 
your household status, how many dependents you have, spouse, that sort of thing, and then your income. And it's wildly different based on your age and, and income and that sort of thing. So the best answer to that is we just do the math backwards on what your employee's average income is. It's really individualized. So I don't even know that an employer can ask that type of stuff. I, I think that's, there's probably tripping over some privacy laws with all that. Sure. Um, but we can, you know, we can, we can dial that in for them. So. Okay, great. Does that answer the question? I guess is there. Oh, I, I, I think so. Yeah, it's, it okay. is not if A then B. If it's A, then you have B, C, and D. That may lead to E, F, and G. Absolutely. Uh, Brianna is adding in some more information on ICRA. Um, and then let's go down to Mike's question here. Can a business have a HSA plan if all employees have individual health insurance plans? HSA. The HSAs are when you have a qualified high deductible health plan that's offered. Or even like out on Minsure itself, there are some plans that are HSA eligible. Now, something you gotta be careful of when you have um, a high deductible health plan with an HSA is if someone has a spouse that is also on an HSA plan through their employer, there are limits to how much can that can be contributed to those accounts. So I think what Sherry's saying is kind of what I alluded to before. Some of these mm -hmm. rules are, are overstepping other IRS guideline rules, right? So um, it's you kind of have to know the whole picture before you start to do this. HSA, in my opinion, is one of the first retirement planning vehicles I fund for our clients um, because I look at it as a, another bucket of assets for that's the best tax break that is out there right now. Um, tax deductible going in, tax deferred growth, tax free coming out for medical expenses. Um, I think we can all agree we're going to have more medical expenses down the road, it seems. So uh, with deductibles and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I, I'm a big fan of HSA, but you just have to know the rules and be able to fund them properly. Um, anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think that's fair enough. Uh, next question okay. is, and so far we only have two more questions. Uh, is there a best practice for dollar amount of an ICRA that is provided by a small business? Cherry's going, no, I, nope, nope. No, I think that's just, it really depends on just the, you know, the business itself, how much the employer wants to put out, depends on the size of, you know, the employee base as well. So I don't, there really wouldn't be, in my opinion, a way to have a best practice for that. It's really just depends on how much the employer wants to put out. Kind of going back to that question where someone said that they had all this money they were putting out to ICRA and then six employees out of what, 65 that were on a, a medical plan right through the company. So it just really depends on how much they want, are willing to put out. Okay. Uh, Nolan added in here a link to the uh, income guidelines through uh, through Minsure um, yep. that people can, can look at. Um, let's see here. Uh, can we get a, just another quick explanation of what ICRA is? Just a high level summary of that. Yeah, I don't remember. It's an individual coverage health reimbursement account. So again, basically what happens is an employer offers their employees, uh, like I guess kind of like a stipend. Like they'll give them, let's say like $300 per month to go out and shop for a plan on uh, Minsure. And then they just submit proof that they paid for the premium and they get reimbursed up to that $300 every month. That works for me. Absolutely. I think that's a, a good explanation there. Um, where am I? Of course, we always have to come into this. What is the best contact info for Pete and Sherry? Is there a certain certification? I put it in the very top yeah. threads. So I'll stick it yep. in again at the bottom. Yep. Yep. So Sherry's and, the yep. best point of reference um, for questions, comments, that sort of thing from a high level or a financial planning standpoint, that would be a really good contact. Um, then I'll put my phone number in for that. I, you can text and call that number. Same for mine as well. Sure. Um, Thanks. 
Yeah, so I guess what I would encourage everybody on the call is a, just a complimentary overview or review of kind of the whole situation, because I think we're finding through all the questions today, it's really um, individualized to your situation. And what makes our firm different is most insurance practices just do insurance, right? They're just handle the life, the health, Medicare maybe, um, and maybe not all the plans on top of that. So we have the insurance division and we're American Senior Benefits, but we help people of all ages. Um, and, and because we're more retirement focused is where kind of the senior benefits comes into place. Um, and then we pair that along with wealth management services to do a review of how the retirement, because we have kind of a similar discussion going on with the types of retirement plans that you can offer and how you position yourself be between you know traditional retirement plans versus Roth versus uh, sure. other, other group ERISA plans that you could do and then you end up you know we have an in-house attorney we have an in-house tax preparer that helps with um, dealing with the tax issues that you can sometimes have with Minsure or uh, with being able to file and get the right deductions and that sort of thing so um, we're just really holistic in nature. Um, you can use any broker that yep. that advertises. We just tend to be um, just more holistic in nature. I haven't seen it's equal up there. So, oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, Mary Robbins from, Robinson from uh, Minsure added in to uh, besides the ASB folks. Uh, there are hundreds of Minsure certified brokers across the state. She threw in a link there. So, certainly, we're not promoting one business as a state agency. Uh, but my personal experience, the way Pete, you and Sherry are explaining things is I've, I've had that personal experience. There are lots of other considerations to think about, you know, whether it's retirement, whether it's healthcare, that they all play into it. I've, I've appreciated the, uh, the kind of low pressure point of information like here, take this information. This is what you'll need to do when you're, when you're making your, your own decisions. Uh, we've got another question here. Why would you choose uh, an ICRA instead of just paying them? Is there a tax benefit? Yeah, there. I know there definitely is a tax benefit to it. I don't know offhand what that is, to be honest. Thanks for recording the call, Mark. We can't uh, officially uh, make recommendations on taxes. Oh, absolutely. I feel like you're setting yeah. us up, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, we we are taking the we are taking the questions as they come in, but that is a a, a real good example of. People have a lot of questions and they, they, you know, it's, it's the trend to find a good resource for that. So sometimes you have to ask and have people say, well, if, if you, if you can come in and speak with us, yes, we could do that in this kind of a public forum. No, I mean, we, we also, same thing with, uh, with starting a business. I mean, every situation's a little different. There are different considerations. You may need a license or permit for this. So. Um, yeah, we understand that we're not uh, we're not going to be able to answer every every question. Yeah, and ultimately uh, that's why we pair, we partner with a tax professional in the office to really give good guidance on those topics and, and yep. make sure people are taking the the best um, make, you know making the best of the rules that sit. So when you think about it, our system, so we've got you know Mincher tax credits, and then that we can't render advice on taxes and then yep. you've got the actual tax IRS tax code and then you've got retirement and financial planning and you've got social security and income planning and <clears throat> it's just the list and the overlay goes on and on and on and um it gets it gets to be kind of a lot right like that's that's <laughs> this, rules. Th this is coming from a from a professional saying it's kind of a lot and i think that is that is what we all feel. Certainly, I'm at that age where I get the uh, unsolicited mailings. Hey, come get a free dinner. We have lots of <laughs> lots of information for you. But I, I can also say that um, there are a lot of uh, free free retirement courses and things that are being offered through your community education. I would say having more information uh, options than than fewer is is better. So I can promise you two last questions. One will be taxes, which you, you're not going to answer, which is fine. The, the question is, is it true that ICRA contributions are considered taxable income if not used for pre-tax purposes? 
yeah, if you're going to take a deduction for something and use it for what the, like same thing with the, as an HSA question, right? If you pull money out of your HSA and it's not for a qualified IRS approved qualified deduction or deduct or uh, allowable distribution, I should call it, then there's going to be income tax and penalties. Yes, I, I would agree. That's the, the, the general wisdom that we try to uh, impart to uh, people who ask us tax questions, what you're, what you're claiming, have proof, be able to, to explain it and have documentation. All yeah. right, our last question. Is there a standard waiting period you see for new employees to get health insurance? For example, 90 days, six months, a year? Yeah. No, I think that's just ultimately up to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the employer. Okay. Yeah, I, there's no pre-existing conditions. There's no waiting periods. It's when your coverage is effective, it's effective immediately. Um, where people get caught, I think, is they didn't buy a plan during a qualified enrollment period because of their employer didn't offer it or they didn't go into the exchange on the right amount of time, they missed the enrollment window, they're locked out. They're locked out for the rest of the year. I think that's probably more applicable than, than a pre-existing condition or a waiting period on anything. Gotcha. All right, Mary has, uh, Mary Robinson again has thrown in some more information uh, regarding ICRA. We have um, uh, some note takers uh, from, we're going to switch gears a little bit from Don Jackson from the uh, U.S. Small Business Administration. The SBA is now accepting nominations for National Small Business Week awards, including the Small Business Person of the Year. Wait a minute. I need to put that emphasis a little different. Small Business Person of the Year, because we don't want a Small Business Person of the Year. So there's a link for those nominations. Uh, for any questions pertaining to SBA resources, um, you've got the link uh, right to... Um, the SBA and their email address right here. Um, and with that, Charles, do you have more information or anything else we need to add here? Nothing, nothing more for me. All we can do is say thank you to our presenters and to Absolutely. everybody who uh, presented such excellent questions here. I said at the start, I didn't think we'd be having to deal with uh, encyclopedic <laughs> uh, questions, and I can see I was wrong. So uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks to everybody who participated in this. Very, yeah, very much. It's thanks. Just not easy. Yeah. It's not easy. Uh, no, <laughs> I, I think we're both in fields where there are a lot of um, puzzle pieces that 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 fit together, um, and you and Sherry do the magic of trying to figure out what's looking at individual situations and what's going to work the best. So, all right. Well, thank everybody. you, everyone. Thank you guys yep. for having us. Yeah, all thank right. You. All right. With that, we're going to head out. Bye, everybody. All right. Sounds good. We're here to serve. So, thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Nice to meet you, Charles. Pleasure. My pleasure.